Facebook. Um, it's in the chat. You can see the link. So it's going live on DSA as well. Yes, Janie, um, you are muted. You can text or type your questions in the Q&A. <laughs> I recording can start when uh, I see the recording is paused, so that would start when we start right three four uh, four six forty five on your time let me see so behind the scenes are you guys recording the video <laughs> 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 they're texting me that they're recording so i think they're okay. recording. yeah i don't know why it says recording so, no i think the recording is gonna start at six thirty five when we start uh, okay. um, yeah, so yeah. pause for now. Oh, we are live on Facebook. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more, one more minute. All right. Did I get the link for the Facebook live? I thing? think the pair is gonna share. Yep, it's coming. <laughs> This is the most organized event I've been to, so that's nice. <laughs> All right, so I, oh no, we're not 635. Did you get the link on Facebook? Because it's in the webinar chat. Oh, okay. All right, so let's start. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's our very first episode of anti-war forums. And then um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context of how this came to life. Um, so anti-war forum is um, something Farida and I are working on and it's part of like DSA anti-war group projects. And then um, basically the way it started was that um, Faida and I go long back, we do art, we also have been in a lot of activist groups. And then what we thought we are lacking is that um, there is always this gap between artists, scholars, and activists. And then the goal of this program is that hopefully um, we bridge the gap by creating a space in which we can share, listen, share ideas, listen to one another, discuss things so that um, we hopefully create a network of uh, like-minded people uh, together and then build a stronger community and then therefore have a stronger impact in the society that we live in. Um, I'm gonna also, um, so this is like the story of the AWF and then um, I'm just gonna share my screen to give you a little bit of background about what DSA is also, which is hosting us. And also like this event is also um, sponsored, um, not sponsored, but like supported by uh, DSA feminist group as well, which is super awesome. And then uh, to give you some information on what DSA anti-war group is, is that we are basically a um, bunch of people who care for like US foreign policy. And then we are trying to kind of do things again, like basically fix things. And then what happens is that uh, people meet um, monthly and then uh, they kind of like go uh, do some, we also have some initiatives within DSA anti-war groups. And then the main ones that we currently have is no war on Iran, which uh, we are trying to like lift sanctions, go against any war with Iran. We have Palestine Solidarity Committee, um, 
And then we have counter recruitment campaign, move the money. Uh, uh, and then we also have reading groups. So we're basically like, basically what happens is that people come with their own passions and then like the groups of people gather around those causes and then they define campaigns and then um, um, they work for it. Um, so if you have any questions on if, Basically, I'm sorry, I'm doing a horrible introduction. If you have any interest in BSA, if you wanna join and know more about any of the groups that I mentioned, if you wanna possibly like, for example, you can just attend one of the monthly meetings and then see how it's going. Uh, just email us at anti-war socialist NYC and then someone would reach out to you, give you more info on all the things that we do. And Speaking out of personal experience, it has been a very rewarding uh, journey so far. Like you participate in other people's projects and everyone gives you a hand when you have a project yourself. So it has been really nice. So um, I'm gonna leave it to Faride and Luma to run the first round of um, anti-war forum that we have. Thank you, Katayun. Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Farida, as Katayun mentioned. I'm an artist and educator and one of the co-organizers of DSA Anti-War Forum. Um, we are delighted to start the first DSA Anti-War Forum with Luma Jassim. Luma is an interdisciplinary Iraqi-born artist um, based in Brooklyn, New York, and Boise, Idaho. Um, Luma has lived through three wars, an economic blockade, and the catastrophe of the U.S. invasion, and later her immigration to the United States. Um, Luma and I had the chance to work on a couple of projects, and I'm super excited to have her here with us for our first series. And um, just to give you a bit of a background on Luma's work, um, her multimedia body of work explores the relationship between violence, politics, gender, and emotional memory. Um, Luma left Iraq in 2006, three years after the invasion. First, she moved to Istanbul, Turkey, and then two years later, she immigrated to the United States. And since then, her work um, deals with war, violence, and her experience with immigration and acculturation. Um, in Luma's work, she uses personal to address the political and activate the viewer's curiosity. Um, Luma often use, um, often reconstructs her memories, traumas, and thoughts on displacement, belonging, and strangeness in various mediums, including mixed media paintings, performance, video, and animation. Um, in 2013, she received her second BFA in visual arts from Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. And in 2017, she accomplished her, BF, uh, her MFA in Fine Arts um, with full scholarship from Parsons School of Design, the new school in New York. And her work has been shown nationally and internationally. Um, before um, Luma starts her presentation, as Catherine also mentioned, we dedicated the last 30 minutes of our um, gathering to Q&A. If you have any questions, please type your questions in the Q&A section on the bottom. Um, if you like a question and you found it relevant or that was also your question, please like it. That would help us to understand what is the priority and um, it would make it easier for us to, you know, go with the Q&A section. Um, and I would like to welcome Luma to present her work. Thank you, Farida. Thank you, Katayam. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all, for this uh, great conversation um, and to give me the opportunity to present some of my work and the impact of war on my work in general. Um, yeah, like it's it's weird, but through my life, I, I like I remember back in at home, I was totally again, like not against, but like I hate politics and I don't wanna get close to it. I think because of the fact that we have a dictatorship for a very long time. But then when I moved to the US as refugees, I found, as refugee, I found myself like really cannot ignore this uh, topic, um, how politics can destroy us, how wars can change your life dramatically and how can, um, you know, 
people or one person can decide your future and give you a different direction than what you maybe think of to be living at your home and you know trying to build up your future. So I will share with you uh, my screen and we'll start to maybe give you, I think I, I would love to start with this image, which is not my work. It's a, it's a map from, um, you know, Google study of uh, map study of one of the things that um, was a result for um, the war in Iraq for I mean, especially the invasion in 2003. That the this image you see here, it's um, a projection of um, thinking of the reason of the invasion itself towards Iraq, um, how it was a war on terror, or the idea of terror that there is a kind of threat, uh, threatness from Iraq towards the U.S. or some other places, but. Actually, since 2003 and afterward, we were facing terror attacks every day. And these dots that you see, this map is just an image of Baghdad um, since 2003 to probably like around 2016. These are the, uh, the car bombs um, explosions that happened in Iraq since uh, the invasion in 2003, putting in mind that before that time, we actually didn't have any terror attack. Um, the, the, um, this is a Mosul, a North Iraq also, uh, showing uh, the car bombs. Um, since then, I feel like uh, living my life in Iraq till I was 30 years old when I left. Um, and of course, I left for the reasons that I can't stand it anymore. There is no peace at all. And it's so hard to, you know, think of your future and you want to live just um, maybe a few years of peace at least. Um, I couldn't, um, you know, like I was always just reflecting on the these memories of the 30 years that I was there because um, I think um, my life and many other people who live in these areas get consumed by war, um, unfortunately, and consumed by violence consumed by uh, giving a different reality than what any human would be uh, looking for. Um, it's, it's really important uh, to use this platform to share, to share some stories maybe um, of Iraqis, um, where I was born, or what I was witnessing during my life and what are the traumas that actually um, maybe I wanna put a, a, a light on today, because everyone knows that war is terrible, war means death, war means um, chaos, but there is other aspects that um, of the, you know, the new way of raising war against country, any country around the world. It's, um, and especially with the American foreign policy that I find it uh, a complete hypocrisy um, in the name of um, liberation or in the name of bringing freedom to these lands, um, there is a lot of uh, lies just for the sake of, uh, you know, getting the resources and getting the oil. Um, uh, so um, I say it's a hypocrisy because I see it like how it's like a, a selective areas of uh, the world, especially in the Middle East, uh, the, the, the purpose of chaos and the purpose of keeping these areas of, um, you know, conflict all the time, um, just, uh, you know, something to, to, uh, to have it as a, um, a front image that there is something wrong there that need to be fixed while the purpose, the real purpose is to get the resources that they want. Um, my work, uh, you know, deals with a lot of these uh, topics and I use a lot of uh, oil and motor oil um, in my art. I use also tar just to symbolize the, you know, the real reason for all the chaos and the tragedy that we have in Iraq. Um, I want to pause here a little bit and... 
I want to share a quote by uh, John Lewis. He said, we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. And this is such a powerful word about like all the Western, I think, um, desires to um, have like very bullshitting reasons to invade and to come to the Middle East um, just for another reason uh, besides what they lie about and what they say they, they want to have. Um, the other thing like um, here I want to talk about this piece. Um, it's a, a sculpture that I use um, different mediums to create uh, a shape of the map of Iraq. And I filled it with motor oil and have these sculptor hands coming out of it um, just to represent the feeling that I had um, towards my country, how it suffered for a really long time. Um, I keep using tar and uh, motor oil for that reason. Here also, I think I started since 2017 to share stories from Iraq and um, use tar on my performances. Um, I tend to use a lot of different mediums just because I feel like there is so much to share and so much to um, um, you know, like there is different ways of expressing what I want to say. And I feel one medium is not enough for it to be, uh, to fulfill my entire feeling uh, towards what ha happened. Um, the other topic that is very important for me to mention here is the war as economic invasion. Um, a war like economic sanctions and how this um, this thing would affect a lot of other realities besides that there is a war between two countries or something like that. Because for me, I feel the most uh, tragic trauma for me is the way that I see uh, my society changed and how people get oppressed to the point that uh, we lost education, we lost um, um, a, a lot of like things that every society around the world would have it uh, handy, um, you know, human rights, um, women's status just get like ruined completely. Um, we don't see any, uh, like women start to, you know, get away from the work field just because it's so, um, become like violent and not um, possible for her to um, be respected as much as it's in general, like in any place that doesn't have these conflicts. Unfortunately, every time there is um, kind of uh, sanction against any country, it would, you know, it would cause a lot of, um, disruption to that society um, and get it to the point that um, they lose, like if I wanna talk about my society, the way that we were very sectarian, um, very sectarian um, country and thinking of my memories with the time that I was a child, how I was like having uh, different things that I see in, in front of me, how people live, how people uh, think about what they have uh, opportunities to from culture, cultural aspects, like you know anything with education or theater, cinemas, bars, uh, people free to drink or to be religious. Everything wasn't like any um, in any point like something like extreme. Um, but after this sanction, especially since the 1991 everything start to go backward and people start to be, um, to just look for a way to survive and to, you know, pass this period of time that is very um, difficult and 
it's become like funny for you to think about like, oh, I want to read a book or I want to do because it's all about surviving the economic situation and trying to, um, you know, pass these per this period of time. But unfortunately, it was like just um, a destruction over and over by the time. Um, this group of uh, work I call long term vision and you see on this character that I'm having here. Um, I almost think of this character as the way the refugee look. I see myself like this, um, very, you know, disfigured in a way, like um, not the way that I look here, but that's how I feel inside, that I'm so disfigured and I carry with me um, memories and I carry with me uh, things that I care about. And I try to, you know, keep something while I'm even moving and going to different cultures or different society, trying to keep things that I, are there to me from long time ago, maybe. But at the same time, it's so hard to, um, you know, it's impossible actually to keep everything. But um, after I did this painting, mixed media painting, I started to animate the figure and then project it on top of the painting, I felt like this character need to move, need to continue on its journey on this life. And just like, you know, um, no matter what happened, we need peace and we need to move on. So this is some images from, um, you know, stills from this uh, animation mixed media painting. This is another piece for the same. This is another project um, where I start to share stories and, um, you know, like having different mediums going on at the same time. So I used um, projection of animation again and live paintings using tar material and sharing uh, stories from back home. It's really hard to like decide on this short time, like what to talk about when I want to think about everything that we went through. But I want to say that for all people who see refugees and think like why they are moving and coming to their countries of this big number, I want them to ask themselves why at the for the first, like the first reason for them to leave. It was um, always like something has to do with, um, you know, using these countries for other reasons. I feel Iraq uh, was a friend in some point with uh, United States, but uh, like during the 80s, we had entire war with Iran was supported by them just because it's good for them and it's good for their benefit. Um, this piece is, one of the results of about uh, the war after 2003, um, we had ISIS and we have extremist religious um, terrorism who started to invade uh, Iraq and Syria, which is almost similar realities. And this piece um, about Spiker massacre, uh, it happened in 2014, where a lot of people get uh, killed mostly soldiers and students around 17 to 1800 in pretty much two days, probably. Um, this is, I, I, I thought like to choose this um, piece to give you an idea about my mixed media work, how, how I do it uh, as a process. So here um, it's one page at the VESA review where it's get published. And I'm showing here the images um, of the paint that I start with here and the image of the Assyrian lions, I try to put them together in a way to represent the Iraqi soldiers who get killed, massacred at that day. Um, and at the end, you know, like the piece would uh, look like, um, as you see it on, let me see, sorry for that. That was uh, the result representing uh, ISIS on this side and the soldiers on the other side.
This is another mixed media work. It was recently, this one and the other piece was at Boise Art Museum. I call this series uh, Frozen Roots. And the reason for that, I think of, um, you know, my history and the Sumerian civilizations, Assyrian and all the Mesopotamian civilizations that we have and thinking of like how reality changed to this part of the world. I mean, Baghdad was a center for so many activities and like center for uh, knowledge and all of that. And, and how war can like, you know, destroy entire reality and make, convert it to habit like right now, our passport in Iraq is the worst passport at all. Like you cannot go anywhere around the world. Um, and um, I try to express myself with, you know, the feeling that I had with my memories from the idea of like living your life thinking that you uh, are attacked all the time or there is these bombs that happening all the time surrounding you that you can die any minute, that you can't even, like your life uh, were in pose for a very long time that you cannot do anything uh, that you look for and you just think about, am I gonna survive this? When this gonna end? And this is a detailed image to it. Are you guys still there? Kateya? Yes, yes. Yeah. I feel like I'm talking by myself. It's just I know it's a very weird experience. Very weird. Like, I feel I'm rocking it. Even I don't see your images, so I'm kind of like feeling that I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Yeah. So a lot of people here think that, um, you know, people at the Middle East or people of this re these regions actually um, hate America. Um, I want to say people there hate America, not because um, they hate freedom, but because they hate the fact that America shaking hand with Saudi Arabia well, it's the source for every terror attacks or whatever happened in an in, in extreme way of religion, uh, but they, that it doesn't work with their uh, service, with, with their benefits of having these sources of oil and whatever. While any country will not be that friendly for whatever reasons, it's become a terrorist and it's become a big lie to get to what they want. Um, there is a, a quote by um, Hannah Arendt. She says, uh, no one has ever doubted that truth and politics are on rather bad term with each other. And no one, as far as I know, has ever counted uh, truthfulness among the political virtues. Lies have always been regarded as necessary and justifiable. Um, and it's so true, like with everything, it's just like a joke. It's like really something, I don't know what to say. Sometimes it's so screaming that it's a lie, but um, everyone take it and then they go with it. And then um, regular uh, innocent people would suffer um, as a consequences for this, um, you know. True, and then they would kill the ones that are truthful or somehow delete them. <laughs> exactly. And it just like I feel for again, like having um, people mentality change because of the oppression that they have uh, around them is really a big thing in my head about like when you think like, whoa, extremist is going so high or like why Islamic religion is going this way and this way. Well, you are feeding it, you are helping it to go uh, worse and worse. Like instead of all these sanctions, instead, instead of all these wars, like help these countries to actually continue progressing themselves or like having education and keeping what that actually functional uh, that they have instead of like, you know, 
breaking them down more and more. And we all know, like when you make people poor, or what they think of is God, or what they think of any source for help, and they don't have anything. So they think like, um, you know, I like maybe God would help me. And then religion start to take a bigger uh, area. And um, some people will use this opportunity to feed people with very ugly ideas about like some thing had nothing to do with religion and lead them to, you know, different uh, areas of uh, being like extremist and or so yeah Luma do you want us to move forward with the Q&A or um... um it's up to you I mean um it would be nice to have a conversation and you know like see what people think or sure um we have one question from um dylan if i'm not mispronouncing your name <laughs> also we should tell them how to put the questions in sure so if you want to put your questions you can um if you go on the bottom there's a section for q a that you can type your questions there um if there's a question that you like um, and you want it to be asked, um, please like it so we know um, it's on demand. <laughs> Other, we would just try to answer all the questions. Um, and also if you're watching the Facebook um, live, you can put your questions in the comment section and we have that open so we would read your questions also from Facebook. Um, so Dylan has a question wondering if you have thoughts on how Americans developed such a collective amnesia around the Iraq war to the point that even the politicians responsible for it hardly mention it, thinking a lot about Colin Powell speaking at the DNC. Can you, can you repeat the beginning? Your voice were cutting. Uh, also, also if you do the Q&A section, if you want to read it yourself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's <laughs> just because I'm doing full screen. Oh, I see. I can do that again. So, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, wonder if you have thoughts on how Americans developed such a, such a collective amnesia around the Iraq War to the point that even the politicians responsible for it hardly remember, hardly mention it. Yeah. Um, I think I think one of the things that really make me uh, frustrated and sometimes like really angry that I don't see like every every war crime happened. It just like for some reason you feel like things are moving away from it instead of focusing on what happened while it's repeat itself again and again. And then we, we we find another story about a different another country and we see the development of almost like some the same thing gonna happen there. But for some reason, a lot of ignorance will happen with like what's already done and to not like give a lot of focus on it. I feel like, for instance, what uh, the uh, MoMA uh, PS1 show they had recently last year uh, on, on, you know, the first um, desert storm in Iraq and like the war of the 1991 why we we address things after 20 years and forget about something that just happened why we don't address and you know open the field for artists and activists and scholars to you know negotiate or try to uh, reflect on something that just happened and we still see the you know the consequences of it um, iraq is still until today uh, suffering from this war crime that happened since 2003. And um, it just like, I, I don't think it's gonna end soon. It will take forever, so yeah. So Zuma, I just wanna say, um, if you stop sharing your screen, that would sure. be awesome. So that, um, yeah. And then we have a question from Mitch. Which, uh, he says, do you think that the US or individual Americans can play any type of positive role in helping Iraq is going forward? Like basically what can we do? To help Iraq? Mm -hmm. As normal citizens. 
You know, it's so, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really a um, good question. A lot of people, when I start talking about all what happened, they kind of feel like so bad and they want to, like, they, they want to do something about it or they feel like um, somehow guilty, but while it's not their guilt, but um, I think it's, it's really easy to damage something and it's so hard to build it. Mm -hmm. um, and the story of what happened in Iraq is not only like one incident that you can recover from. It's really hard to answer this question. Me, myself, I don't know how to help that because I think the continuity of like the desire to have conflict on the whole area there, not only Iraq, will never stop. It, it, it's intentional and it's very obvious. Um, if you look at these countries at the 60s, 70s of time, you will see how these societies are different and open-minded and everything look alike like anywhere else around the world. While during these 30, 40 years, all this damage that happened, it's, it's not only the war, it's not only the invasion. It's like, it's like everything that America would support for certain time and then get some benefit out of it and then it doesn't work for it and then it's suddenly it's enemy and then doing something else so I really don't know how to help maybe the only way is just like to keep fighting against any um, any uh, pursuit to do similar act uh, somewhere else and um, maybe to bring awareness and educate people around what's happening actually, because there is difference between people who, who lives a war on their land and the bombs are falling on their head, than a country who like has a war but never heard any bomb. Like everything is just like thousands miles away from them and just see maybe at the news, maybe if you watch news or not, you will see one segment about what happened. It's totally different when you have to sit, to suffer every day and to be dealing with everything strange for so many years. And following that conversation, I had a question. Like, like I'm from Iran and like when it comes to Iran, you realize like, oh, I wish people like left people that we share the same passions knew this stuff about Iran. What what would be what what is left in America missing when it comes to story of Iraq? Is there any complication that you feel like you wish DSA people at least knew about, you know, like any? Yeah. I think there is a lot of maybe everyday life situations that really would make so much sense about like, I think bringing empathy to the idea of like what war could do with other countries is very important uh, to make people aware of this, the, the facts that these things happened and what the result of it in more, um, I don't know how to say that, but like to make it more obvious or like share a lot of stories or put more, um, you know, focus on like trying to bring this work and writings and on, on, on these topics and have it available for people to see and to read and to get um, more idea about it. Um, ben is asking, thank you for sharing your art. Um, it's very beautiful. Do you have thoughts on how sanctions have affected sectarianism in Iraq? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think this is the biggest trauma for me. Um, how sanction affected um, the, and I talked about it, like how people like cannot continue the same way when you, when they lose everything. I mean, the sanction that we have, just to give you a simple idea, now we are at the Corona time and many countries feel some economic, um, you know, problems and feeling like things are changing. The, when we had this sanction, the economic sanction, the recession was so bad that from the time that you have your uh, dinar, we have like our money is dinar, when you have one dinar would be like $3, it changes to 
one dinar, uh, I mean, one dollar would be 1,400 dinar. Mm -hmm. So like a salary of a person, which was good for his family, who are like six people or whatever for entire months, suddenly it's not enough for one or two days. Anyone can imagine that? I, I, I can't like, even now I can't, I can't believe what happened that you in one day you have to face this fact and you have to you know find secure security for your family and bringing food on a table in in this um you know extreme way of uh, recession and that didn't happen in one day or two that's continued for like more than 13 years um, which caused a lot of uh, poverty, which caused a lot of uh, pretty much moving backward instead of forward um, and getting religion growing more and more. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sad story that I feel in Iran we are going through right now. Like you mm -hmm. wake up and without any exaggeration, there was one night that the value of the money dropped to half. So like what you had earned the whole life was just gone. And that was even a good old days. Like it's right, even worse. Right. And on top of that, like when this happened in 1991, after we have like 43 days, the, the desert storm took like 43 days when Saddam invaded Kuwait and we get punished for it, that the ground didn't stop shaking from the bombs. I think the whatever, like 35 nations against Iraq at that time for what Saddam did, they used every kind of weapons. We have so many names for it, just from the way we hear it, like how it sounds, like, you know, and um, like having this destruction that happened at these 43 days um, affected every, um, you know, resources that we have and no electricity, no portable water, no nothing for so many years after that, having this very hot summer in Iraq and not having electricity was another hell, but you have to get out and work and do something just to feed yourself. And of course, in every sanction, every the things like that, some people benefit from it by like investing. And so you see the gap go really high. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Paul, uh, which uh, it's up for your open interpretation or how you want to do it. Uh, so she's, uh, he's asking if you would be interested to share one of your powerful images and talk about what it means for you. So basically okay. going more in depth into one of the works that you like the most or you feel about. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is different images I would like to share with you. And thank you for asking this question. But I think just continuing with the topic that I was just talking about, I would talk about this piece. Um, so what you see here, it's, uh, this is Baghdad after liberation. And it's a really large piece, like it's around nine feet or 10 feet by five. Um, after, after the 1991, we had a lack of electricity for a really long time. And I think just that, I, for just this topic, I would write a book about it. How we, we had to suffer for a very long time, having very hot summer. And um, there is a lot of generators start to come up and China keeps sending us different invention of uh, different types of, uh, you know, generators, big generators for companies and small generators for like, it's different prices. So everyone would have like every house will have so many cables coming out of their house, going to different other areas, like maybe we, we don't have electricity, but two blocks away, there is someone who has electricity, so we can get a little bit power that we can have maybe a fan and you know some lights uh, at that time there is no fridge and you know freezers working everything become like a cabin you put stuff on it ice it's a dream about it like to have ice um 
so this scene, like always when you walk in the streets and you see all these cables, it's so dangerous, but it's like over each other and going like from on all direction is just like so um, stuck in my mind that uh, always. And uh, this piece is about it. Um, I don't know if that. How big be... is it? I'm just curious. Oh yeah, it's really huge. It's like nine, nine or 10 feet tall by five. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's one of my favorite pieces. I told you before. <laughs> um, Eva is saying um, that what you're saying, Luma, um, is so, so true. And the facts are so infuriating. And we have to talk about this all the time. Um, and I totally agree with that. And also, I have a question for you. Um, I guess also as an artist who deals with the same subject matter. Um, and also you talked about, you know, institutions, you talked about PS1 having exhibitions and um, it's always too late and too little. And the presentation is not, I guess in my opinion, is not inclusive as um, I would um, wish, it for, wish it to be. And I was wondering, um, you know, your experience living in the United States for the past few years. Um, how do you see the relationship between artists, activists, and scholars in different communities? And also, how do you see the representation of um, these artists and activists in the institutions? Right. Um, I think my experience like, had a uh, different period of time's experience, I would say, because like the beginning when I came to the United States, I came as a refugee and the first place they chose for us was Boise, Idaho. So the first, ex uh, you know, um, the first experience of reality here was in the Midwest, which is like every time in New York, I say I come from Boise, they say, what the hell you were doing there? Like, how, how did you survive there? I love Boise. It's really nice. It's uh, beautiful, um, nice people, but also there is a lot of conservative and all of that thing. So for me, I felt like really struggle for the first uh, years trying to make connections, trying to uh, get my voice heard. And I think I, I had something going on with different artists or whatever, but it wasn't enough for me. So I that's why I decided to move and, and go somewhere else. And I went to New York City. And in New York City, I feel like still like this connection, um, still very, uh, there's a lot of obstacles on it, like to, to convey. But probably I, I don't want to just like say things in general, like about this subject, but probably also I was in a learning process like how to communicate and how to get uh, to meet people and to have things. And by the time I start to see actually a lot of things happening and I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about having good relation with, you know, between activists and organizations, but I wish that they really look for these subjects more and more and try to support it because it's just like um, almost a prevention for the continuity of this reality on some countries around the world. I, I don't see that it's, uh, it's the exposure on it is uh, too high so far. Even going back now in Boise for the time that the corona is happening, I found a very supportive community and we are really working in so many different projects on different topics. Um, that has to do even with politics and this stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Doug is asking what role, role can art play in building ties between socialist fellow travelers in the US and the Middle East? And I guess in continuation of what he said, like, and what you just said, I'm thinking like, like, you know, like we are all here in this Zoom chat and then we all live, most of us in New York. What can we do together? You know, like, Mm -hmm. sky is the limit what can we build you know yeah um i think everyone want that you know want to find ways and want to find a group of hands to like 
do things together because I realized by the time that like being by myself, doing things by myself is not that effective as much as when you really have a group of people and this group is just growing and like, you know, because everyone knows so many people and then it just like, I think the spread of it would be even wider. Uh, and that's what we need to work on to have more collectives and more um, open platforms for others to join and to, you know, make this possibilities of linking or having this um, understanding of both areas uh, more possible. And what do you think the role of art can be? Because that was especially asked about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, art is, uh, I think I think as anything in life, music or novels or like writing or whatever, you you get something out of it, and that's why that sometimes people say like art doesn't need to have like necessary every time has to have a message. I think art need to have a message. Art needs to be, um, and I'm not saying all art need to be that, but we need more of that. We need more of that. Like when I look in history and I see like different uh, images of Goya's work or like, you know, anything like reflect a certain period of time or an event that happened, make me like so curious about it and then know more about what happened. So we are, artists are way, putting art is a way of documentation of what happened because I think artists are the most truthful than any other medium. So, um, I have a question by Fahim that I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fahim has, is asking, do you find attitudes toward U.S. foreign policy vary significantly in different parts of the country? I guess that goes back to your previous comment about living in Boise, Idaho, and your experience living there. Um, so the question is, if the um attitudes are different like in midwest versus east west coast or all americans generally are the same in different in or are, are the same or indifferent um to these wars i mean this is very great question it's just because of like how much i felt difference in these four years uh last four years from the time like i was here for seven years before i moved to new york city and then i'm in new york city for five years I was coming just for a month and coming uh, going back. Uh, but this time I spent like really, this is the longest time I'm spending here. And I felt from the beginning, like from the first few months I was saying, I feel uh, racism. I feel racism around me. Uh, I didn't feel that uh, before that much, you know, like, like now. Um, and uh, I even, was stopped by a police officer and get humiliated really well uh, for like really almost like no reason for an hour and a half. And I have entire story about it that I felt like, wow, this is real. Like, and, I, and it's, it's totally different um, from being in New York. I don't feel that much of these uh, incidents like here. Um, but I think the way we have the political scene right now is encouraging uh, a lot of things to come on the surface more than other times. That's why it's very important to vote this November and to not let another four years come up with worse than this reality. Yeah. Um, there's also, maybe this could be our last question. There's another question by Fahim, and I think it's an interesting question. Have you encountered censorship in the US as an artist, especially with anti-war work? Have I witnessed what, sorry? Censorship. Mm. Um, so, um, can you can you explain the, the question a little bit? Fahim, do you want to explain that or do you want me to explain? I can explain that. <laughs> um, 
I, I can explain it from my perspective. So I would say maybe Fahim explains the question. So, you know, as an artist working with the subjects around anti-war, talking about your experience um, coming from Iraq, have you ever experienced censorship in terms of representing your work or um, sharing platforms or any other form of censorship if you experience that? And Fahim says, have you encountered censorship in the US? Censorship meaning her work is blocked by institutions. No, I or, didn't. Like, um, I didn't. I didn't have something like that um, so far. I feel like maybe getting maybe rejected, that would be kind of censorship in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to say this, sorry for jumping in, I feel like the system is so clever in censoring, so they're not going to censor you directly, they're just not going to give you grants and exhibitions, and then you feel like you're... Exactly, like how much, how much you get, uh, yeah, how much you get support maybe to say more or to bring more to the table, um, I think that's only on that way, I would say that what uh, I would, uh, yeah, and how much do you fit the narrative of institutions in terms of representation? Do you fit in that box that they describe as Iraqi artists, or are you talking out of that box? And if not, are you being um, pushed back, or have you been censored? Which I think grants and institutions and exhibitions and all of that, and I think that would cover. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it varies. It varies. Like some some places would be like really very supportive. I feel like they like my voice and they want to support it more. But in general, I feel like it's not that um, there is no really that much of like um, um, open possibilities for what I want to do or what I want to say. I, I I was I was thinking uh, that I would get um, bigger opportunities and bigger grants to bring different projects to what I'm talking about or what I'm experiencing and what I'm putting on my art, but it wasn't the case so far. Like that is a whole new Zoom event. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, um, so right now it's 7.29. Um, so thank you so much, Luma, for joining. Um, it was amazing and way better. Like, it, it was awesome. And um, yeah, really. And then uh, for everyone who is here, this is obviously our very first episode that Farida and I have put together with help of DSA OC members and all that and with gracious attendance of Luma, um, it's only gonna get better if you guys help us to make it better. Um, we have it kind of like freestyle open-ended format so that we can evolve with everyone who's here. So if you know a good artist, if you know a cool scholarly work, if you wish something that you see here that you don't see on mainstream media, any conversation, shoot us an email because we need your help to make it better. And then we're gonna uh, like mo like carefully study each of them. And also like, again, like speaking of communities, there is this DSA anti-war group meets monthly. You can just attend the meeting, don't participate in any projects or initiate projects, attend in any of them. Um, so if you wanna learn more about that one as well, um, just either way, email DSA, group and I'm gonna share the email with you guys so that you know and Numa do you wanna I, I feel like it's better if it finishes with <laughs> your thing. yeah no like really thank you so much for having me and um, I think the conversation will continue and there is a lot of things to cover and thank you so much I support you and I wish you good luck Thank you. thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us and your questions and participation for making it more interactive. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope to see you again in our next forum. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye.